He himself gave the apostles, as well as the prophets, as well as the evangelists, as well as the pastors and teachers, for the purpose of training the saints for the work of serving, in order to build up the body of Christ. This is to continue until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, resulting in a mature man, with a stature reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ. The goal is that we would no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, when people use tricks and intent and invent clever ways to lead us astray. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we would in all things grow up into Christ, who is the head. From him, the whole body, being joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows in accordance with Christ's activity when he is measured out each individual part. He causes the growth of the body so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours through your God and Father and through your Savior, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. These are some of the phrases that Paul wrote, which we just read. Unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son. Mature, speaking the truth in love. Growth of the body so that it builds itself up in love. Those phrases that Paul wrote describe what is going on in the world today. I think that if you pulled someone on the street, if you pulled them aside and asked them what words currently describe our world today, they wouldn't say anything like this. Rather, they'd probably answer in terms such as isolated, distance, injustice, unrest, violence. Well, why the discrepancy? How come the words that Paul is using here today are so different than words that we would use to describe our climate? Well, there's a simple answer to that question. Paul is describing something here that is not of this world. The Apostle Paul here is describing the work of the Holy Christian Church, what is also called the Communion of Saints. It is that universal church of all believers in Christ. And yes, that church is made of believers who are in this world. And yet, that church is instructed to be not of the world. Jesus said in John 15, If you were of the world, the the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The Holy Christian Church is in a unique position. It has one foot in this world, and it has one foot in heaven. The church is held to a higher standard because those who are in the church have been called to be Christ's representatives here on earth. This is the blessing that Jesus' ascension gives us, which we talked about last Sunday. Jesus is gone, but we are still here, and we are blessed to be part of the ministry and his work and his word in our communities. Today, I don't know if you can see the banner or not, today is Pentecost Sunday. This is the day when we recount how the Lord did exactly what he promised, that is, giving the Holy Spirit to the apostles. He did this for a purpose, so that they'd be able to go out to all the corners of the world and spread the gospel. It's also the day when we, too, see that we are a part of the same ministry as those men were. We, too, are called to the same mission. We, too, are cogs in the exact same machine that they were. We are built into the kingdom of heaven for the mission of saving souls. I think it's a mission that we're all aware of, but sometimes it's very easy to lose focus of it. Because of the nature of the Christian church who remains in the world, it can be easy to focus on only the things that we can see, the things of the world. And that's why it's good to go back to the beginning, to see how and why the church started, and to take our next steps 
based and informed by our first. Today, we will see that being a part of Christ's church means that we are given to build, and we have been built to give. So we pray, Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. 11 and 12. He himself gave the apostles as well as the prophets, as well as the evangelists, as well as pastors and teachers for the purpose of training the saints for the work of serving in order to build up the body of Christ. That day of Pentecost is the culmination of Jesus' act of giving the disciples. Yes, he had called them much earlier in their lives to accomplish this purpose. But during that time, when they were first called to serve Jesus and up to this day of Pentecost, they had received very important training from Jesus himself. They would learn from him. They would ask him questions about the kingdom of heaven. And they would see his word work in real time. They saw the power that Jesus possessed. They saw his word accomplish miracles that could not be explained. Finally, they saw that word also fulfilled when he was crucified, resurrected, and finally ascended into heaven. Once Pentecost takes place, the training wheels for the apostles finally come off. Perhaps you know the account. There is a rushing of the wind into the house that they were in, and tongues of fire sat on each apostle's head as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They then spoke in tongues, much to the astonishment of those who witnessed this. Peter then stood up to describe what was going on there that day, and he quoted to them what we read as our Old Testament reading today from the book of Joel. Peter concludes, I will show wonders in heaven and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. At Pentecost, there is, of course, initial confusion as to why these Galileans are all speaking foreign tongues. How were they able to do this? Well, some dismiss this outpouring as simple babblings, Perhaps they were drunk, even one supposed. But that was simply dismissing the outpouring of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was much more than just that. There's a similar argument that can be used today. The argument goes something like this. How could Peter, James, and John, such men, write the Bible? They're uneducated. Weren't they just simple fishermen? They didn't even go to school. Well, such arguments fail to understand just how much God is able to give. Not only could God accomplish great things through meager men, but that's kind of how he operates all the time. That is how the kingdom of heaven is spread. God sends people to tell other people about Jesus. They are converted, and then they do the same thing. The apostles started it. And so God has been able to continue his church. It's good to remember the origins of the church. It's also good to remember your origins in the church. How did you first come to faith? Who brought you the word of God? For me, it was my parents, perhaps you as well. Maybe it was a grandparent. Maybe it was a friend, an acquaintance, maybe even a spouse. You now have the opportunity to do the same thing with others, to give what has been given to you. The purpose of the apostles and others like them is given here. The purpose of training the saints for the work of serving in order to build up the body of Christ. A couple other interesting concepts that Paul brings up here. Not only are we part of the ministry of bringing Jesus to other people, but we're also built into his body as well. Not only are we built into the body of Christ, such an amazing gift as that is, 
but we also have been trained for the work, the work of serving. In Philippians 2, Paul says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem oneself better, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So how does such an enterprise continue? How does a church go on that's based on serving others? How does it continue to exist when it is founded upon sinful men? Well, certainly there will be flaws in it, but something, rather, someone holds it all together, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned here in this text. You might find that strange on account that it is Pentecost Sunday, but I think it's appropriate. The Holy Spirit, although he is not mentioned, is very much at work in this text and throughout the whole Bible. He is the very thing that Paul mentions. He is that unseen force at work all throughout the church. He ties the whole church together and is the only reason that it's able to exist, let alone continue. I don't know about you, but for me personally, I miss sports. Seems like quite the minor thing to mourn in this day and age. But since the pandemic started, we've missed out on several very important sporting events. March Madness canceled. The Masters canceled. The NBA and the NHL would be in the thick of their playoffs right now if it wasn't for this pandemic. It seems like a small thing to grieve, but I think something we could all use right now. But one of the most regrettable losses is perhaps the loss of baseball. Our national pastime has not started yet. Baseball is unique among all the sports that I just mentioned because it is a team sport in the truest sense. Basketball is driven by its stars. Golf is a sport of one. Hockey is driven by its lines and its dominant goalies. Baseball is different. One great player on a baseball team doesn't mean a whole lot. It takes nine different players to feel the team. They need to play together in order to have success. Even if you have the most dominant hitter of your generation on your team, it doesn't mean that you're going to win. You need people in front of him for him to drive home. You need people behind him to drive him home. And also, if you only fielded eight players on a team, any team worth their salt would be able to dominate you. Can you imagine taking the field without having a shortstop? That team would be a rug mat. The best teams work together. They complement each other, driven by the exact same goal to put more runs on the board. And in a way, the same is true about the Holy Christian Church. Everyone in the church has an important function, an important job to play. From the missionary overseas to the parish pastor, from the president of the congregation to the small child in Sunday school, from the usher down to the mom who is bringing her kids in, into the church building, we all have a purpose. We all work together to be reminded of the fact that our sins are forgiven and that same gift of forgiveness by the death of Jesus is available to anyone else. If the church is like a baseball team, then the Holy Spirit is certainly its manager. You don't notice the baseball manager on the baseball diamond, that is, unless there's an argument with the umpire, but they are quite vital. They are the one who is steering the ship. They are the one who determines all the unseen particulars. Who bats where? Who's best served in which position? Who plays what spot? Where in the lineup will they hit? The manager seems very unimportant, but they are the one who gets everyone on the same page and leads the team 
where it needs to go. The goal of the church is mentioned here by Paul, but first let's start with what the goal is not. Verse 14, the goal is that we would no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching when people use tricks and invent clever ways to lead us astray. Whenever there is a group of people coming together, it can be easy for them to lose their way. After all, you have many different sinful and flawed people with different ideas about what should be done. When it comes to business or even sports, different ideas can be a very good thing. But not when it comes to the church. That's not to say in the church there is no room for opinions or differences, but rather there is no room for different teachings. Paul writes in another letter of his, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. When it comes to the church, that is the body of Christ, it simply cannot move in different positions at the same time. It needs to be on the same page. The only way that a group of people can be wholly united is by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who guards us against what Paul is warning us against here, false teaching. He is the one who keeps us united in the truth of God's word. Without the Spirit, the church would be nothing more than a children's soccer team driven to and fro by wherever the ball happens to be at the current moment. But with the Holy Spirit at the helm, we are a professional team of witnesses that sees the bigger picture. What is that big picture goal that the Spirit would drive us to? Verse 13, this is to continue until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, resulting in a mature man with a stature reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the end goal of the church, to lead us to maturity and knowledge of Jesus. Jesus is the measuring stick. There's no way for us to get there on our own. We can never measure up to the life and example of Jesus Christ. But that is what the beauty of sports teams, team sports, is. It doesn't just depend on one player's strengths. Rather, it pulls all the players together and it uses all of their strengths. The unit of the church has but one goal, to save sinners. It is built by God out of sinners. It turns them into saints, and they, in turn, tell others about that same opportunity. The only way a group of sinful people can function together like this for this purpose is for the Holy Spirit to continue to hold them together. Yes, Jesus gives his church talented servants to build it up, and he gives the Holy Spirit to keep it united together. So what does that united serving body do? Well, it grows, and it functions in love. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we would in all things grow up into Christ, who is the head. From him, the whole body being joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows in accordance with Christ's activity when he is measured out each individual part. He causes the growth of the body so that it builds itself up in love. What's the best way to stay strong? All you have to build up the body. This is true when it comes to weightlifting. The only way to get stronger is to continue to work out your body doesn't feel good necessarily. We don't enjoy doing that. But the saying that jumps to my mind seems to be true. No pain, no gain. This is also true when it comes to diseases, something we have now been very familiar with. One of the things we have been told about this pandemic is that we have to get to a point of what's known as herd immunity. That is to say, enough people need to have the disease, in fact, and develop an immunity against it before we can safely return. 
And that's what a vaccine does, isn't it? A vaccine is a small dose of the disease given to the body so that it can familiarize itself with it, adapt to it, and defeat it later. The growth of the church happens in the same way. Paul commonly refers to the church as a body, as he does here. He also states in 1 Corinthians, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. No pain, no gain. The only way we grow into the body of Christ is through lessons of pain. Since Christ is our head, the only way we can grow is through him. The body is not going to function properly without contact to the head. People can stay alive without any brain activity, but it's not much of a life. They have to be kept alive by life support. One of the most painful things to learn is that the human, li- the human race is all on life support. That is what the time of grace is. God extends a period of grace to all people so that they can come to him, come to a knowledge that he is their savior. But many like it just the way it is. They think they don't need a God. They refuse to come out of their vegetative state of sin but they'll not be able to grow, not without being a part of the body of Christ. We need the head before we, the member, can do anything at all. Cut off that contact from the head, and eventually, life support runs out. And we are no different. This text is taken from, of course, the book of Ephesians, which is all about acknowledging the past for looking ahead to the future. I think many people are familiar with Ephesians chapter 2, but how does that chapter start out? And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead. It might have looked like we had been living, at least we were going through the motions of life, but without Jesus, that's not really life at all. The only way we can grow, the only way that we can live, is through Jesus. And of course, this is the glorious calling to which we have been called to. It's only by grace, through faith, that we are saved. It's only by that free gift of God's grace, through the work of Jesus Christ, that we have been saved from our sins, pardoned from them. The only way that you can know this is by faith in Christ. Without this, we would die and atrophy into our sins. But he has made us alive, and now we function as members, bodies, body members of the body of Christ. There is a lot that is unloving going on today. Sure, I'm not breaking any news here by saying that statement. No doubt you've seen the recent images of civil unrest. It seems almost everywhere. These remind us that we live in a sinful world where sinful things will continue to happen. Loss of life, loss of property, even the collective loss of our minds. It also serves as an example as to why the Holy Christian Church is so important. It continues, that is, the church, that body of Christ, to shine a light in this sin-darkened and hopeless world. It continues to extend that olive branch to sinners who are dead in their trespasses and sins. How do we know this? Well, it takes one to know one. We were dead. We were on life support. We were on our last legs. But the power of Christ came in and saved us. We have now been made alive. Who once were dead? We now function the way that a body should. We don't do this because we have the power and 
the strength in and of ourselves, but rather because he makes us strong. We have been given a new life and have been built into his body, which is life. We, in turn, give that same life to others. The message is the same as it's always been. It's that conclusion that Joel and Peter resounded. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isolation, distancing, injustice, unrest, violence. Those are terms that might be used to describe the world we live in. But the beauty of being part of God's holy Christian church is that we are also outside of that world. Where there was once only isolation and distancing, now there is togetherness, unity in Christ. Where there was only injustice and unrest, now there is the grace of God given to us by faith through the Holy Spirit. Where there was only once violence and hatred, now there is only that peace which surpasses all understanding, the peace that we have been forgiven from our sins by the blood of Christ. Christ endured true injustice, true violence, and went to the cross to pay for my sins. Because he did that, we have now been built into his body. We have been tied together in that body by the work of the Holy Spirit, and we grow together in that knowledge of salvation. This will continue until we reach fewer, few, full maturation with Jesus in heaven. There we will have full contact with the head of our body, Jesus Christ, forever. All praise and thanks be to that head of the church, Jesus Christ, who paid for our sins, and to the Holy Spirit, who gives us the knowledge that saves us, the knowledge that we are forgiven. Amen.